All right, so today we're going to talk more about ray optics. And let me just review two of the main, main things we saw last time that both resulted from Fermat's principle, which is that the, the rays take the shortest, the path of shortest time, or at least, you know, more formally, the path that extremizes the time. Given that waves traveling through some media with index of refraction n, the speed of light in that media is slower by a factor of n. Uh, okay, so the two things that we that we proved were that if you have a, a mirror surface and light comes in, it will bounce off at such an angle that if you draw a normal to the surface, the angle of incidence equals the angle of refraction. And then the other thing we saw was that for, for a, a surface where you have uh, two different indices of refraction, say N1 and N2, and I did this for a straight uh, uh, straight boundary, but this boundary doesn't have to be straight. It can be any, any shape. If I have a ray coming in and there's some angle to the normal theta one, then some fraction of that ray will reflect off. And of course, the angle of incidence equals angle of refraction. So these are theta i equals theta r. So this is also going to be theta one. But then there'll be the normal on the other side. So if these are really clear, clear media, you can sort of see the, the shine off of a window. You can see your reflection in the window. That's about 4% of the light reflecting back at you. Um, but uh, in, in the other media, the, the angle that the ray will take will be at some, some other angle. Maybe I should have made it a little bit more dramatic. other angle theta two. And from the Fermat's principle, we derived Snell's law, which is that n, n1 sine of theta one equals n2 sine of theta two. All right, so these are the two, two basic laws. And from here, you can pretty much trace the rays through, through any optical system with discrete components, as long as there's not some continuously changing index of refraction. For that, you need more like a variational principle. But if you had a series of mirrors and interfaces, and we'll see a lens is just an interface into glass and then another interface out of glass, um, any series of these things, you could just apply these laws point by point by point and, and trace the rays through. In the computer graphics, this, this is called ray tracing. And rather than trace the rays from their source and see where they all go. Usually in computer graphics, you imagine there's a, a view, a view box. Hold on, I can't, there we go. Can't bend my wrist quite like that. There's a view box. And for every pixel in your view box, you launch a ray in the opposite direction. And since Maxwell's equations are time inversion invariant, any wave that travels in one direction, uh, if you just reverse all the, the time in that, play the movie backwards, the, uh, that is also a solution to Maxwell's equations. Since these rays are approximations to solutions of Maxwell's equations, they also, that also applies to the rays. So for every pixel in your view, you can trace rays that, that uh, come from you know, some imagined eyeball through that pixel and ask, where does it go? So instead of, instead of going out this way, um, it'll, it'll hit, hit some in, interface and, uh, and go the other way. And of course, you have to be a little bit, a little bit careful about taking into account uh, where, where the rays could have come from. So any ray that, any ray that ends up coming, coming into your eye could have come either from this direction or from a reflection that, that ended up uh, bouncing off and then ending up in your eye over here. And, and there's some pretty cool computer ray tracing uh, well, what, so what do you need beyond that? You need maybe one other rule, which is how does light bounce off of solid surfaces? And, uh, and that, that again is just taking a normal and asking what, uh, basically a dot product. So if you had a sphere and you were illuminating it from, from the side, 
you sort of imagine what a sphere illuminated from the side looks like, and, and you can get exactly that picture, the amount of light that comes at you uh, based on the light that's bouncing off from the side, that's, that's, uh, that has to do with the dot product of the, the light with the normal of that sphere. So with those three rules, you can get some really cool looking computer graphics where you imagine uh, looking through surfaces of water with certain ripples or looking through a, a series of pieces of glass, glass spheres, glass lenses. And, uh, and with just these rules, it, it looks super photorealistic by tracing all these rays. So we're, we're not gonna dive down that path of, of tracing every ray because uh, sort of like in electronics lab, for those of you who took it with me, a big philosophy of that class was, I don't just wanna teach you to analyze circuits. I wanna teach you how to design circuits, how to come up with new situations. And this ray tracing is really good for analyzing stuff, but uh, you know, the way you would design an optical system to do something isn't, I'm just gonna throw down a bunch of random mirrors and lenses and analyze what's going on. There's gotta be some, something, something more that we can, that we can say. And, uh, and for that, I'm gonna talk about the, the techniques today of focusing on paraxial rays, rays that stick close to some axis. And then we'll talk about the effect of, of lenses on this stuff. So that's where we're gonna to go today and then probably next time. All right, so let me, let me just introduce what is this concept of, of paraxial rays. Well, in almost all optical systems, uh, complicated sets of lenses are, are often arranged along an axis. So if you imagine the inside of the a complicated lens on your camera, so here's, let me just draw a zoom in of the camera here. Here's a camera. There's some image sensor here, and maybe there's some object way over here. Uh, there's somebody having fun. You're taking a picture. In this camera, there are a bunch of different lenses and maybe some are converging lenses like this, and some are diverging lenses like this. Some are little lenses, some are big lenses. But in almost all these systems, they're all arranged along some, some axis. And, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Uh, uh, okay, so what are examples of, of things besides a camera lens? Well, a telescope is like this. All the optical components tend to be arranged along an axis. A microscope is like this. Uh, lasers are like this. A projector is, is like this. Uh, and, and this applies to even things that are not exactly like this. So you can imagine if you, if you had some lenses, uh, let me draw this a little bit better. So this is a little bit more general than, than just the, the cases we'll consider. If you imagine some lenses along an axis, say like this, then if you had a, a mirror that just bounced the ray off at some other angle here, and then you have lenses, more lenses along, along an axis, uh, you can still arrange this, uh, uh, you can still analyze and design these kinds of systems using the techniques that I'm gonna talk about today. It's just when, when I talk about the axis, the optical axis, it's, it's now this, it's not, it's not just like a Z axis that goes out to infinity. You just have to, your, your, uh, your coordinates are your distances, are gonna be your distances from this center axis. And as long as all your optics are arranged so that their centers are along this axis, even though the axis is bending, uh, you can still do all the, all the stuff we're gonna do today. And, uh, What's, what's great about this is it allows you to keep track of only two numbers for each ray. So a general ray in three dimensions is, is coming from somewhere and it's at some, some angle in three dimensions and uh, you have to keep track of a lot. For, for this, if we're dealing with these uh, paraxial situations, we'll only keep track of two numbers. So let me, let me write what those two numbers are. So if this is the optical axis, oftentimes this is called the z-axis because that's, you know, when there's one axis picked out, physicists often like to call it z. Um, 
And imagine you had a ray that started here and went off at some, some angle here. So the two numbers we need to keep track of are the y coordinate. And, and we could generalize this to, uh, to uh, two dimensions. But for now, we'll just, uh, well, we can generalize this to three dimensions where we have x and y. But for now, since everything's going to be pretty rotationally symmetric, we'll just stick with y, the distance from, from the axis, and theta. The, the angle that this ray is making. And uh, for every, every ray that we consider, we'll just keep track of these two numbers. And what the paraxial approximation says, and this is an, an approximation we're going to make, we're going to not worry about rays that are at some crazy, crazy angle, right? So they're, at every point on this person, there are light rays coming off at every possible direction. But only rays that are at pretty shallow angles end up in this camera, in this optical system. And so we're going to make the small angle approximation. We're going to make the approximation that, that theta is approximately equal to sine of theta, which is approximately equal to tangent of theta. And if I think about this in terms of a slope, this is the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So this is something like d, dy, dz in terms of a slope. Or we could call this, uh, let me see if this is actually equal to this, equal to y prime. This is the paraxial approximation that we're going to that we're going to work with, that the, the rays are all mostly along the optical axis. There aren't any huge, huge angles. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to use linear algebra. And this is, this is great. For, for small angles, uh, we'll work out for a lot of optical devices we care about. All of their transformations are actually linear transformations on the two things that we keep track of. So, so we're going to keep track of our two things in a, in a vector. Uh, in a vector of y and theta. This is a little bit of an odd vector because it doesn't have, you know, y has some dimensions of, of distance and theta doesn't have dimensions. So it's odd to group these two things in a single vector. But uh, there's nothing about linear algebra that, that prevents that. I'm just going to group these things in a single vector. And all of the things we consider are going to be linear transformations on this vector. And I'll work out some examples, and you'll say, oh, yeah, OK, for that, it's definitely linear. Oh, OK, for that, it's definitely linear. Uh, OK, so uh, well, yeah, let me, let me actually write. So what, what is a linear transformation on a vector? Well, a linear transformation on a vector is a matrix. So we're going to have, if you start with some y1 and theta1, and you want to turn that into some y2 theta 2. Oops, this marker is uh, starting to get, well, starting to run out. Um, there'll be some matrix that connects these two things, which is often called the ABCD matrix. And uh, this, yeah, so this is matrix here, M. Is either called the ABCD matrix or the ray matrix or the transfer matrix. It's what takes some initial ray at some initial y position going at some funny angle theta and turns it into a new ray going at a new theta. I think this will make a lot more sense once we do some examples. So, so the examples we're going to consider are uh, just propagation through free space and going through various lenses. And so let me erase my little review here, and uh, and I'll I'll go through some of these examples. Now the uh, the textbook, which is this, uh, you know, it's an online PDF book, which uh, which I've linked to on Sakai, it goes through a little bit more formality about 
what we mean by uh, linear, what, why, why taking this approximation here um, really gives you this linear linear property. But you know, as usual, anything that's linear has to do with doing some sort of first order Taylor expansion. So you can imagine the first order Taylor expansion of sine of theta or tangent of theta is just theta and we're just ignoring all the higher order terms. And so as long as theta is small as along the axis, we, we can do this first order approximation and any higher order corrections are, are not gonna be, are not gonna have this nice linear property but the, the more paraxial we design our situation to be, the better this approximation becomes. And uh, you, know, you can imagine that when you take a picture of something, unless it's a crazy wide angle lens, this approximation is pretty good. The angles are, tend to be much smaller than pi. And for the crazy wide angle lens, you need to go back to the ray tracing and, and really kind of piece by piece talk about uh, where all the rays go. And those systems are much harder to design. Okay. So the first example that we'll do, that we'll find the ABC matrix for is just propagation through free space. So let's see here, free space. So this is super simple, but it'll give us a, a nice, uh, uh, Nice example of how this works. So here's the optic axis. I'm basically going to redraw that same picture over there. We're going to start with a ray that, that starts off at some y1 and goes off at some, let me just make this dotted, goes off at some uh, angle theta. Let me draw that a little bit more shallow. Goes off at some angle theta with respect to that line. And we'll say, let's, let's propagate this ray for some distance d and ask what is the new, um, the new y coordinate and the new theta. So the new y coordinate is this, y2. And the new theta, since nothing's actually happening here, is just going to stay theta. And the great thing about having a linear system and using linear algebra is if you work out what each of the basis elements do, you're done. You don't have to work out every possible combination of y's and thetas. You could work out what happens in two particular uh, basis situations. So imagine that, uh, imagine, well, but yeah, well, let me, we'll, we'll use that fact a little bit more in a second. But let me just write down if this is theta one, then what happens here, the ray is still going off at theta two and theta two is just gonna be equal to theta one because nothing's actually happening here. We're just propagating through free space some distance D and we can just write what Y two is. Y two is just Y one plus this derivative of Y one, so D dy dz times uh, times d, All right? So the slope of this line, dy dz times d, gives us our, our new y2. And as long as we're only considering rays that are traveling at pretty small angles, this is just gonna be y1 plus theta one d. All right, so now let's imagine we, we had some, some y and theta, what matrix would, would lead to this transformation? So let me imagine a y1 theta one as a, a vector that I'm gonna multiply by and let's actually work out what matrix we need to give us this y2 theta two which we've already determined to be um, y1 plus theta one d theta one. All right, so 
So in this first entry, I want y1 here. So I, I need a one in this top column when I do the matrix multiplication. I also need to add uh, d times theta one. So I need a d here. And for here, I want no amount of y1 and one, one theta one. So, so this is the matrix for M for free space. It's free space over distance D. And here you, you can verify for yourself if I, if I propagate distance D and then I propagate distance D2, I can work out the, the matrix, the multiplying these two matrices together. Let's, well, yeah, let's just do that. All right, so let me show you that in this situation, it's, it's linear pretty simply. So this means that, you know, I can do composite operations just by matrix multiplication. So if I have a one D one zero one, I'm propagating first by D one, then I'm propagating by D two, one D two. If I multiply these matrices together, what do I get? Well, here I get one and one and zero. Here I get uh, D one plus D two when I do the matrix multiplication, D one plus D two, great, so far so good. Zero, zero, still get zero here and zero, one. All right, so in fact, just by doing matrix multiplication, I get, I get that I propagated, I get the matrix for having propagated distance D one plus D two. All right, so, so far so good. Let's work out the more interesting case of, of a lens. So uh, let me first sort of define define some terms here. And if you if you watch the video, this this will make a little bit more sense what what we mean. And and I'm not gonna uh, go from the geometry of the lens itself to this uh, matrix, although there there is a homework problem that that addresses this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from uh, the effect that a lens or a magnifying glass has on light to, to this matrix. And what, what that effect is, if I have, uh, well, if I have, uh, yeah, well, yeah, let me, let me just pause there. I'll, I'll take questions and I'll erase this because I think I want the whole board to draw this next picture. Go ahead and stop me if uh, there's anything that's unclear. Hopefully, at least this should be pretty straightforward why compositing these two linear operations by matrix multiplication works, works the way we think it should work. Uh, the lens stuff is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. So, so the next thing I'll do is a thin, thin converging lens. So by thin, I mean that the lens itself is thin compared to say the distance from the object to the lens. So the lens is, is much thinner than the other distances involved. Uh, then we don't have to worry about the higher order nonlinear terms that will screw this up. Converging means the following. If, if you have a light source here, say the sun, and it's infinitely far away, 
I guess I'll draw it horizontally because that's how we draw most of these diagrams. So imagine the sun right at sunrise or sunset. Um, the sun is so far away that by the time the rays reach us, they're extremely, or by the time the, the wave fronts reach us, they're extremely parallel. And so the rays from the sun are all extremely parallel to each other uh, going in a particular direction. And, and you can work out exactly how, how flat these, these rays are. And it's you know, something, something to you know, fractions of a wavelength of light across any optic that you can reasonably consider. Uh, and, and we're gonna put a converging lens here, which we'll draw like this, like a magnifying glass. And what we find just sort of, in, maybe you can take this as an empirical fact is for, for the lenses that we use, a converging lens will make all these rays converge at some focal distance. So some distance F away, if the rays start parallel and only if they start parallel, all these rays are gonna converge to a single point at the focal distance. So if you have rays that are coming in that aren't all parallel, say because you have an object that's much closer, they're not gonna all converge one focal distance away. The focal distance is defined for uh, parallel incoming rays. They will all converge one focal distance away. All right, so now, now let's work out using linear algebra what the transfer matrix for this lens is. And what we're gonna consider, let me draw the situation here. So here's our, here's our optic axis. C, I have my converging lens. Uh, it needs to be centered on the optic axis. I don't know if I drew that picture quite centered, but imagine that I am a better artist. Uh, and let's imagine a ray coming in at some height y1. And we're asking, what does this lens do? And we're not gonna, we already know what happens in free space. So we're really just asking right at the, at the thin lens. And remember it's, it's thin because we're gonna take this as existing at a particular point in space, not having any real thickness. We're gonna make the approximation that we don't have to worry about the thickness of this lens, or we're gonna make the approximation that we're just gonna consider the net effect as if it were at a particular point. We're gonna ask, what does this do to a ray right at this point? And, and what it does is it takes a ray that's coming in at some distance y1, and it deflects it at some, some angle. Maybe I'll draw an angle a little bit more shallow. Deflects it at some angle, such that eventually, if I continue this, it'll it'll hit a distance f away. And this angle clearly has to depend on y1, because if, if all, if a ray here is gonna get deflected, it has to get deflected at a shallower angle. So the rays, the deflection of these angles gets bigger and bigger as I move off the optic axis. Uh, but if I'm gonna stick to this paraxial approximation, uh, the, I can't, I can't have an enormous lens. I have to I have to keep the lens some reasonable size so that none of these angles are are uh, anywhere near forty five degrees, or uh, or uh, I guess whatever uh, one radian is. They're always much less than one radian, fifty something degrees. So so let's work out what what the lens does at exactly this point. And let me let me do some geometry here. So this is gonna deflect a ray, a positive Y1 is going to deflect the ray with a, an angle that it will define as being negative. So if I were to actually label this, this angle, I'm gonna label it as negative theta. So theta itself is negative. So I'm labeling this you know, real honest to God positive angle as negative theta. And just from geometry, in order to uh, to make it hit at, at this point, this just has to be uh, in, the, in the small angle approximation, this has to be y over f. So, you know, and being more careful, it would be the tangent of theta, or the tangent of minus theta is y over f. 
but uh, in the small angle approximation, theta is going to be, I can even write an approximate, approximately y over f. All right, so, so now what do we have here? We, we, we have a situation where we're starting with y1 and zero angle. And this gets multiplied by some matrix that we'll, we'll determine in a second. And what we get out is we get, uh, well, right at the other side of this lens, it's still y1. Right? Again, for an infinitely thin lens, if we're just considering the effect of just this lens and not any of the free space propagation, right on the other side of this lens, it's still going to be y1. But we started out with zero angle, and now we have a, a new angle. The new angle is going to be uh, the angle is going to be minus uh, minus y1 over f. Okay, so what what does that tell us about this matrix? Well, that and that tells us that uh, we we can know the the first. Uh, we can know the first column of this matrix based on just asking how this basis vector, you know, you have a non-zero uh, first element and a zero second element. Just knowing how this basis vector goes through the matrix tells you the first column of this matrix. So what does that say? In order to get Y1 here, I need to have a one here. And I can't say anything about this, this one here. So I don't, I don't know yet. And here, in order to get this, quantity here, I need a minus one over F here. And I can't say anything about that element there. All right, so, so let's work out the other situation, which is even simpler. What is the other basis element? Well, the other basis element is I have my lens and my optic axis. And my other basis element would say I have zero, zero Y, but some non-zero theta. So let's imagine I have a ray coming in and hitting the lens here. Um, the, this, this lens isn't going to do anything to this ray. It's just going to come right out at the same angle. And if you look at a, a lens right, right here, the basically two flat, two flat pieces, you're just going to get, get out what you get in. And so here, if I have some, uh, zero, Theta one, what I'm going to get out is zero theta one. And I can work out the matrix for this. And this basis element is only going to tell me about the column that, that I needed. So, so I can't say anything about this, can't say anything about that. But in order to get zero out here, I need to have a zero here. In order to get theta one out here, I need to have a one here. And since the system is linear, I can take any linear combination of this basis vector and that basis vector, which is just some generic vector. And I can work out that M for a lens is one minus one over F, zero and one. And remember, this is not, not the lens plus some free space propagation. This is just M of the lens. So in the homework, you'll you'll actually work out if you actually had some some object here, some distance away. You have to propagate in free space, then apply the lens, then propagate some more in free space, and you'll work out some some properties of that uh, that product of matrices. For now, we're just working out the the matrix of the lens itself. All right, so that was a a converging lens, and in the last last little bit, I'll work out uh, I'll work out what a diverging lens does. So let me uh, what do I want to keep? I kind of want to keep this, but I want to use that space. So let me rewrite it here. So M lens is one. Zero minus one over F one. Okay, so let me change this to a thin diverging lens.
And a diverging lens is, if you're uh, nearsighted and you have glasses, they are slightly diverging lenses. They have a shape that looks like that. And what do these do? Well, these take incoming parallel rays from the sun, say, and they spread them out. So that ray is going to go straight through. This ray is going to come out this way. This ray is going to come out this way. And let me draw the arrows somewhere else here. If we were to trace these lines back, and if I, uh, if I were to use, let me draw this slightly less exaggerated here. If I trace these lines back, and I'm going to make any, any ray that's not a physical ray dotted, if I were to trace this ray back here, if I were to trace this ray back here, and if I were to have all the rays in between, so there's one here, it's going to go off at some, oops, some intermediate angle. I have a ray here, and it's going to go off at some intermediate angle. If I do all the dotted lines backwards, for all possible rays from the sun, I'm going to find that they, they would meet at a point that is a distance, uh, a certain distance behind the lens. And I'm just going to define that distance as negative. So distances in, in front of the lens are going to be positive f. Distances behind the lens are going to be some negative number. And so this, this physical distance, which is a positive number, is going to be negative f for the diverging lens. And uh, let me draw, just in the last 10 minutes here, let me draw some, you know, the equivalent of this and work out how it, how it goes on the basis vectors uh, to show you what the, what the matrix for, for this diverging lens is. All right, so the equivalent of this picture, I have an optic axis, I have a diverging lens, I have a ray coming in, parallel with some y1, and it goes out at some positive angle, say theta 1. I'm going to trace back with my dotted lines. You know, they're not, not real rays, but just extensions of actual rays. And I know that this is distance here is minus f. And um, I can work out just uh, just from the geometry here what what happens at this at this lens, not not counting any of the free space stuff. So, so again, if I start with a y one parallel to the optical axis, I'm going to multiply by some matrix, and I'm going to get out what I know should happen here. So right at this lens. There's no, there's no shift, so I'm still coming out at y1, but I'm coming out at a new angle. Instead of instead of zero, I come out at some some theta one, and you can work out what this what this theta is. This is just the positive version of this, right? So instead of negative y over f, I guess I should have said y1 over f. This is just y1 over f. Right, so if you think of the, the complementary angle here, its tangent is going to be y1, this height, over, uh, over this distance, f. So the, the tangent of this angle is going to be, uh, uh, hold on, this needs to be minus f here, minus f. F, F itself for this, I'm defining to be the negative number. So this distance is minus F. This distance is Y1. Tangent of the theta, which is about the same as theta, is going to be Y1 over minus F. All right, so that allows us to work out the, the, uh, this column here. So again, this is going to be 1. And again, if I want minus Y1 over F, I want a minus 
one over F here. And then I can do the same thing for the other basis vector, which is no distance on the axis. It's a, it's a ray that hits directly, goes directly through the middle of the lens. It's just going to keep continue. And just like here, zero, theta one, I'm going to get directly on the other side, it's still going to be zero for y, and it's still going to be theta one. That tells me that this column is zero, one. And you know, you might have thought it would be a little bit odd to define the focal length of this lens as some negative number, but that allows me when I combine these two columns, I get the exact same matrix. So that's nice. I only need one, one matrix to describe both converging lenses and diverging lenses. I just have to remember that for a converging lens, there is a physical focal distance that's in front of the lens where physically parallel rays physically focus. Whereas for a diverging lens, there's, uh, uh, there's, it's defined with a negative focal length. And anything in this lens optics that's negative, it means there's sort of some extensions of actual real rays backwards end up, end up meeting somewhere. So that's, uh, that's pretty convenient. So we'll use the same, uh, same matrix with the same four elements to describe converging lenses and diverging lenses. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there. I well, let, I guess I have five more minutes. Let me introduce you to the topic next week. We're not gonna do, uh, or sorry, next next class. We're not gonna do a huge amount of of math on this yet. But uh, I'll, I'll show you the concept of how do you form images with these lenses, and you know images that aren't just of a focused sun out at infinity. So let me let me erase probably everything here except this matrix, and I'll take some questions before I draw draw the imaging setup. Uh, I'll, I'll go backwards in, in time here. So let me stress that for something like a, a camera lens, which is pretty complicated, it actually contains multiple individual lenses. The, the first order approximation of that is just the matrix for propagating, matrix for a lens, matrix for propagating some more, matrix for lens, matrix for propagating some more, matrix for lens, matrix for propagating some more, and then maybe you're at the image sensor and, you, and you're done. And just by this linear, uh, linear process, you can uh, you can work out what what the net effect of all those lenses are, again to first order. So what that means is that as long as the the rays are really parallel, as long as you're really zoomed in on something really far away, it's it's quite a good approximation for what's actually going on. Prof Kalikia. Yeah. Why does it make sense for theta one there to be negative? Why does it make sense for theta one here to be negative? Yes. It is not negative. F is negative. So negative F is a positive number. Oh, 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 oh Does that make sense? So negative yeah, yeah. F is the actual I see. positive I see. distance. I see. Good, good question though. Yeah, it's, I would say that keeping track of all these signs is the most, most confusing thing. So you asked exactly the right question to, to nail the, the kinds of things that you're, you'll have to, to worry about. Because some of, you know, it's a little confusing because distances here can be negative if they're on the wrong side of the lens. So, you know, there's the, the actual ray goes off at some funny angle, it diverges. But uh, if we draw these extensions, they converge. And so the focus is, there's nothing actually focused here, right? It's kind of a virtual focus uh, just by extending these rays. And oftentimes when you have things happening like that, uh, they come with, they come with opposite signs, and that that allows us to keep track of everything with a single set of equations. You just have to, the, the specific cases are dealt with just by assigning the correct signs to things rather than by uh, 
um, having separate equations for them. All right, so I've got about a minute left, so I'll just draw the picture for what we're going to talk about more next time, which is uh, which is imaging. So here we're going to imagine that we have some object. And you can imagine, at least at first, we'll just have a single point. It's often drawn as a little arrow at some distance y1 above the optic axis. I'm going to have some lens here. Let's draw the lens like this. Um, and again, we're sort of approximating this as infinitely thin, but I want to draw it thick enough that you can see that it's a converging lens. And what you'll prove in your homework, and this is this is one of the more interesting homework problems, is if you draw a bunch of a bunch of rays. So there are rays coming off of this point at every possible angle. If you draw every possible ray, what you'll find is that if you go through the matrix of propagating in free space, hitting the lens, propagating some more, you'll find that they'll all end up converging. to a single point over here. And there's a relationship between the image, or sorry, the uh, object, object distance, O, to the lens, and the image distance, oh, I made myself a room here, I, to the image. And we'll find that this, for a particular point, all angles converge on a single particular point. And for every other point, let's call this x here, if I draw every possible ray coming off of x, they will also all converge on this x. So for every possible point in this object, it will converge at a particular point in this image. And the relationship between these three variables is that 1 over o plus 1 over i it is going to end up equaling 1 over f for the lens. So none of these are at infinity like the sun. So none of these distances are going to be the focal distance, even though the object comes to focus at this image distance. So I would say from here, and I, and I do have to go to give up my light board in a second. From here, uh, you can probably do almost all of the homework and on Friday, I'll dive into a little bit more detail on, on how to do how to do this stuff. And basically the last the last big problem on the homework, I'll talk about how to do on Friday. That would be the big kind of design problem for the week. All right. Let me uh, I'll take I'll take some questions as I'm erasing, but you're you're free to go. And I, I have to give up the light board for a different class in a second.